my life, he has been so, so good. Amen. Hallelujah. We praise you, Father. You're so worthy. You're so worthy. Jesus, the name above every other name. 
You're so worthy. You're so worthy. Hallelujah. 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 Most worthy. Worthy of praise. Exalted.
are so worthy. You are so glorious. You are so mighty. You are so wondrous. And we know that you inhabit the praises of your people. And in your presence is fullness of joy. We know you're already here. We know the reality of it is, wherever we are as believers, you're there. For you don't dwell in a temple made with man's hands now. And now you dwell in our temple. Our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You live, dwell, and abide inside each and every one of us. We love you this morning, Father. We honor you this morning, Father, for you're so worthy, you're so glorious, you're so mighty. You're so worthy to be praised. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the Word. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. Thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for the places you brought us through, and thank you for the place that you brought us to. But, Father, in saying all of that, yep, we stood on your word and listened to the Spirit of God, followed his direction to get to where we are. But we know for every day and every service, there's a plan. There's a purpose. This morning, we've already prayed, but we come to you humbly and reverently. Father, it's a fact that you're the only one that knows the state of every heart and life. You know the word. You know the word from your word that they need thank you Lord Jesus and praise your holy and mighty name thank you Lord Jesus we just glorify you and magnify you and honor you well you keep getting so frustrated because you're just adamant that it's going to be your way and you get mad and upset in general, but even at others when it's not your way. You don't yet understand that the Christian life doesn't truly begin until the Christian realizes his life is about pleasing the Father and not himself. It's not about endeavoring to inquire to go higher. It's about surrendering to the Lord and allowing Him to fill you and take you to that place that you've never been before. Now I say this to you this morning because you're highly upset and you're very frustrated. Quit trying and surrender to me, saith the Lord, and I'll be able to do those things that you've yet to allow me to. And in this place you are today, because of your own decisions, I'll bring you out and I'll see you through. But the results are totally up to you. So now you take that and you do with it as you please. But the best thing to do is not be puffed up, but to get on your knees and seek the Lord and let him do what you can't do anyways. Now, Father, we love you and praise you. And I thank you that one will make those right decisions. I've been in that place, so I know well about it. And I know that's the right word off of the fresh off the press from heaven. And it's in line with the word because as I said, I've been there. So I thank you that the way up with you is down. The way to more with you is less of me. John said, I must decrease, he must increase. It's not about my way. It's about to surrender to Jesus who is the way. So, Father, now this morning, you know the people in this place. You know what they're facing today. You, you know the future better than we know the present or the past. I thank you for the word, not just any word, but the right word right now this morning for these people in due season, just the right time. Being ministered by the Spirit of God, believe they've come. Hearts and minds open, ready to receive, comprehend, and understand what thus saith the Spirit of God. As they receive it and apply it, their lives will be changed forever. We thank you for that, and Holy Spirit, have your way in our lives in this place. Move in and through us to accomplish your perfect will, plan, and purpose, and we thank you. In the last day, men, these lives will be changed, challenged, and altered forever, never to be the same again, but above all else, everything that's said and done will give you the glory, honor, and praise you so deserve. We thank you, Father, we count it done by faith right now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You can be seated. We'll get into the word. God is with us. As I said, taking up the offerings, I'm very excited about what God has done, what he is doing, the place he's brought us to, 
if you have been following God and his plan, if you hadn't been, today's the best day to start. But if you've been following God and his plan and you've been in tune with the Spirit of God, you know your best days are yet ahead of you. You know that even in the storm, storms of life, as Brother Hagin used to say, even the crises of life, he said, come to all of us. But as you trust God, he'll see you through. I want you to turn to Luke 18. This isn't my message, but it goes with what the Holy Spirit just said. Luke 18, 18. And then we'll just say this and see where we go. You know, the results you get in your life are not up to God. That's unpopular, but it's true. God in and through Christ Jesus has already revealed everything that needs to be revealed, already given you everything that pertained to life and godliness. The plan of redemption is complete. This book here, the Word of God, reveals what's available to you, right? You already have authority concerning possession. You're not endeavoring to acquire. You're defending from a place of present possession. The devil tries to knock you out of that place and off of that place. In Christ, you're seated with him, seated together with him in heavenly places, right? When Jesus overcame the devil, who did he overcome it for? And it was for you and me. It was for all of mankind, but the only people that benefit from the plan of God are those that submit themselves to the plan of God, right? And you run into in some, some times and places in your life where it comes down to certain things in your life or God's plan, and you have to decide what you're going to do. And you have to be careful when you get called up, it's going to be my way. I like this, and I have people in the church, and this isn't present tense. To my knowledge, the church is doing better than it's ever done. So I'm not up here picking anybody apart from the pulpit. I don't do that anyway. But I don't have any knowledge of anything that's going on. But sometimes you'll have people that are adamant about, I, I, th- I, we want, I want it God's way, I want it God's way. And they'll say that during church service, but if you get around them any other time, all they'll talk about is everything they won't change in the church to their liking. You can't want it God's way in your way. It's either God's way or your way. But see, that works at home. Luke 18, 18, a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save or except one that's God. 20, thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. False witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he said all these have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he saith unto him, yet lackest thou how many things? One thing. Yet lackest thou one thing. He knew, Jesus knew what had this fellow. He knew this fellow's process. We, we've talked to you about this. This is one of those passages that definitely has dual meaning because this fellow was endeavoring to follow the letter of the law as a Jew to obtain salvation, and Jesus was letting him know, your plan is worthless. It will never allow you to accomplish what you think you're accomplishing, right? He said, because Jesus is our salvation. There's not five steps you can follow to acquire salvation. Salvation is in and through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's one of the things, but he said, yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast. And distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. And many people will say, well, if you just meet Jesus, your whole life will be changed. That's a half truth. This fellow met Jesus. And the Bible says, he was, and as he heard what Jesus said, when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. So Jesus knew what had him. Now today, it may not be have anything to do with money with you, but I've learned this. Father knows best, and Father wants what's best for you. Anything in your life that God deals with you about, even given to him, the purpose is not to hurt you. The purpose is not to take from you. The purpose is to make more room for the master, right? Because whatever you occupy, and whatever occupies your time and attention, you'll naturally become like. If you're consumed with the world, you'll be a worldly Christian, a carnal Christian. If you're consumed and you occupy yourself with the Word of God, well, what will come out of you? The Word. That's a no-brainer, right? We can pray prayers and say things but not mean them. 
because God will let us know, and we're going to get to this message in just a minute, but we've been going through some things for years. And this is what God has been moving, how he's been moving, and the way that he's been working. Many have been praying for revival and a mighty move of God. Matter of fact, I'm getting ahead of myself, but the Lord just asks you questions sometimes, and it really just makes you think. It's amazing how smart he is. Amen? I'm 47. Some of you guys are younger than me. Some's older than me. But I've heard, I'm not knocking nobody. Don't, don't get upset with me. But I've heard all of my life these three words, and I don't disagree with them. We need revival. I've heard it my whole life. The Lord spoke to me the other day. He said, you know, he said, all of my people just about say that. He said, do you even know what it means? I mean, it's great to have, get revival if you need it. But it's like Brother Hagin used to say. He said, a lot of people are staying under the mountain. He said, but if you get in line with the word, you can live on the mountaintop. Don't make it one day. Victory is a present possession. Satan's going to come daily and try to steal it. But I know the end from the beginning. And that when I, my faith is placed in the Lord God Almighty, it doesn't matter what comes. The God is greater than the mountain, than the valley, than the opposition. But when you set your faith, many people don't understand this, but you're learning and I'm learning, and we're growing. We set our faith, and we begin to say, this is what the Lord said, this is why many people just give up on revival, because you begin to pray, and set your faith, and maybe fast, maybe have times of prayer, praying in the Holy Ghost, and we want revival, and then things begin to happen in your life that look like loss, and then we lose our attention, and our focus, and our faith for God to move when we don't realize what was necessary for revival to take place was the removal of the hindrances in our life. But we begin to believe God for him to move, and then we begin to, looks like we lose things. Well, you know, Paul counted those things lost. Loss is what in Philippians 3? Gain. When you get serious with God, one of the biggest things that changes is your value system. You don't value what you used to. And some things that may not have been of the devil by any means, they, they stood to take your attention off of God so you don't place the value on them before because they're not as important as keeping your eyes on Jesus, who's the author and finisher of our faith. We are entering in to the best days and times of our lives if we've been obeying God. John 16, 13. Many of you know this. This is one of my favorite scriptures. I don't know that I've never preached a message, ever preached a message without praying this before I preached. As I told you earlier, I'm not going to rush this morning just listening to the Spirit of God. I'm going to minister this to you today. Wednesday, we're coming back, and I'm going to say what the Spirit of God says say. We're going to spend time praying, and the people that pray with us know we don't usually do this in the service, but I am Wednesday night. It's going to be a prayer service in a time where we share some things from the Word. Then we pray some things out. And as believers together, we're going to spend time praying in the Holy Ghost. And I can give you a 100% certainty that God's going to speak to us. 100% certainty. See, how do you know? He does that every other day. And he promised me that he wouldn't his Word. So I don't assume Wednesday night will be any different. He's going to speak to us and speak through us. So if you want to hear some things from the Spirit that God's going to say, it, it'd pay you good dividends to come Wednesday night. You say, I don't know, what, what's he going to say? I didn't tell you I knew that part. I know how to get a hold of him. I don't tell him what to say. I listen and be the vessel. Amen. And then next Sunday, today will be generic, not, not generic, but it applies to the body as a whole. There's some things that God wants to, he has been preparing us but he wants to prepare us for some things to come. 2024. And I just wrote this down. It's the title. I'm sure they got it somewhere. The year of harvest. You say, well, every day is a day of harvest. You're 100% correct. 
where you are today, what you're receiving today is, is, is harvest of decisions that you have made or those decisions that you have not made. You're, you're 100% correct, and, but we're going to get into this a little bit. God has been moving in our lives. This is not for me. I've had people ask me, why are you uh, staying somewhat on this same thing? It's a flow that we're in. It's necessary. There are people in the body that are confused about things that have happened in their lives. lives. There's people in the body that hasn't understood what's going on. You need to know what God's doing. You need to know why he's having you to operate and move and make the decisions that he's having you to make. Because some things presently can hurt. But you know, there's such a thing as going and having surgery with a doctor. Something that they can fix. And I know they can't fix everything, but it can be something they can legitimately fix. 99 times out of 100, if you go and have surgery to repair something, initially there's more pain. Until you heal, there's more pain than you had before you had the surgery in a lot of cases. Now that's over in the natural. But when you get serious with God and begin to seek God, he'll go to work on your life if you truly mean business. And he'll say, I require this and I require that and I want the other. I'm getting ahead of myself, but we'll get there in a few minutes. About this, we need revival. That's a mouthful, believe it or not. Because when you say we need revival, if we truly don't have it, it has to be diagnosed to what's hindering it. And the hindrances have to be addressed or there'll be no revival. Many people are living their life, even churches and ministers, like if we just keep on going, something's going to change some way, somehow. That's not correct, and it's not biblical. Amen? If you want to be confused, just listen to what every preacher you know is saying about the new year, 2024. It happens the same way every year. We receive a word that is mind-blowing, straight off the fresh, all fresh off the press from heaven. It's beyond awesome. Everybody gets excited. We step into the new year and nothing changes. Then we repeat this process at the beginning of the next year. It brings confusion. It's fruitless. And it's not of God. I pray things out for many different reasons. But, but another reason, this isn't judgment. But my father in 2004 was my pastor. I don't know if anybody remembers this but me. And I'm not saying he was wrong. I'm not judging it. But in 2004, the message for the year in January was 2004 was the year for more. That was in January. Now, this wasn't God's will. What happened? I'm not telling you that. But then in February, he was diagnosed with cancer. And in December of 2004, he died at 49 years old. Well, you got to make sure the more that you are getting is what you want. You can have more mess or more blessing. More is a, is a term and a word that we may need to be careful with. Now, if you think I'm opposing dad, that's 100% wrong. It's not true at all. In no way. I know there's more to the story than just even what I know that happened. I'm not trying to say the word wasn't from God, but it will at least make you pay a little more attention. Now, I'll be honest with you. When I thought about it is when the Lord told me about 2024. He said it'd be a year for more, and then he began to talk to me about the harvest. I said, Lord, I'm not sure I want that message. I don't know. Daddy got one 20 years ago. You keep that, you keep that one for you and him. Y'all can celebrate up there. I ain't coming yet. I don't want that one. Love me say it's a year for more. That's the first thing I thought. <laughs> Had to be careful, right? And, and today's message is more for the body, but next week, you know, be more for our body. Be more specific where we are and what we're going to do. John 16, 13, Jesus said, I'll be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come. He'll guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. Whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he'll show you things to come. He glorifies me, he shall glorify me, and, and he shall you shall, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. 
So the Holy Spirit, just from this passage, he guides us. Not just all over the place into the truth of God's word. Right? Communicates with you what the Father and the Son are saying. So we listen to the Holy Ghost to get that guidance, to get that direction into the Word, but from the Father and the Son. But another thing is that He does, He shows you things to come. Right? I know where we have been, I know where we are, and I know where we're going because I know the Holy Ghost. Christians say all the time, it's a blatantly ignorant statement, nobody knows what tomorrow holds. God knows and he'll reveal to you all that is necessary that pertains to your life. I can't tell you everything about the future, that's only God. But as far as it pertains to my life, God will make sure when I'm in tune with him and listening to him, he will make sure that I know what is necessary for my life and what's to come. It's like I told you earlier. It's never happened in my 47 years. I don't know whether to be happy or to be on guard and cautious. It started about three weeks ago. The Lord began to warn me. It was the night before we had prayer. I actually went hunting that evening. And before I got out the stand, is on the way home. I was going to turn the worship music on that I have, that I listen to on occasion. And the Lord said, nope, I want to talk to you. And he did all the way home. Then we come the next night, that Tuesday night, and we sat in here and prayed. And we prayed and sought God. And the Lord spoke some things. He went all the way back and brought it all the way till the day. And he's talked to me about it repeatedly. And he did the same thing this morning in my office. He said, I need to warn you. I need to caution you. Well, the first thing when the Lord says warn you, your, your next thought is, oh, my God, what's next? What's coming now? My God. He said, no, no, no. He said, I'm warning you because it's time to harvest what you've sown. He said, and many people get in trouble when the harvest comes more than they do in the hard times. Brother Hagan always said, I thank God for the hard times in life. Because if it weren't for those times, I'd have never sought God like I did, which propelled me to where I am today. Now, in, in the present, most people, including myself, don't thank God. You thank God for being God in the fire, but you don't thank God that you're in the fire when you're in the fire. I don't like the fire. It's not fun. It's hell on earth. It is. I've been there. I've been in times in my life, and I'm not comparing it with nobody, but I hear people talk about being scared of dying. And we've been in some places in our life when I wasn't scared at all. I said, Lord, it'd have to be relief. My God, it'd be a lot worse things than dying. So do you need to be willing to die? Yes. You remember Elijah? Wasn't Elijah? After he ran from Jezebel, after he had the confrontation, He prayed to die. Coming to the end of yourself is necessary to come to the beginning of God. It really is. To come to what God's called you to come to. You find those things in the hard times of life. It's, it's, it's just human nature. It's not the nature of God. But human nature doesn't depend on God very often until we have nothing else to depend on. It's not God's will and you don't have to do it that way. But many, many people, you can study behind Wigglesworth. I forgot which book it is. I read it numerous times. But many people that turned this world upside down had to come to a crisis, had to come to an end before they ever got serious with God. But when they come to that end in their life or that crisis of life, when they come to that end and they turn to God, everything changed. So he guides us. He communicates with us. What the Father and the Son say, and he'll show you things to come. As Christians, if we will only listen, we have inside information about the plan of God and what's to come in our lives. As I've gone through this message, the Lord has led me back. That's why I keep going back. I got notes everywhere. I got them marked at the house. And a lot of times he leads me back and he said, this is what I told you. You need to know what God's saying today, but you need to know what he told you last year. You need to hold fast to everything God's told you. Hold fast to the promises, Right? and the confession of your faith until it's manifested, and then you don't need to confess it anymore. You just thank God it's there, right? But the Lord led me back for this message. And one thing I continually saw for the last six or seven years, matter of fact, it started, J.M. Morgan was married five years, two days ago, two days ago. It started about a couple years, 
but I've been saying two or three years. It's actually seven years ago because it was a couple years before that the Lord began to deal with me about some different things on the front side of where we are now, and I thank God for where we are now. But it was seven years ago because it was the December, two years before they got married, he began to deal with me. But the theme that kept coming up repeatedly, the Lord kept telling me, he said, I am preparing you. You know, the preparation is just as important as the destination. Luke 9, some of these passages we've gone to repeatedly. Well, I use the same passages, but I have more revelation and see them more clearly than I did when we started. It's just like giving to God. Giving is God's way, not just financially. You will be a giver in every area of your life. When you get around people, you will not try to take from them. You will want to put into them. It will change your marriage. It will change your home. It will change your relationship with your children when you eradicate your life from self selfishness from your life. When, you, when your focus is the love of God and you get around people and what can I add to you, it changes things. It changes your environment. Wherever you go, things are different. But I had to come to that place. God had to prepare us, had to equip us. And I'm not going to get into all of this, but in Luke 9, you can write it down. We actually usually go 51 through 62, but I'm not, I'm not focusing on all of that. I'm just going to read one of them. It's 57 through 62, but in, in Luke 9, he said, Unto them no man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, it is fit, is fit for the kingdom of God, is fit for the kingdom of God. And for those that have cooperated where you are today, you are perfectly prepared and positioned to fulfill and accomplish God's plan in the earth. He has been preparing you. He has been equipping you. And very often during that time, it looks or seems like nothing is happening, but you're being prepared and equipped. I think back to the three or four years when I worked at Blumenthal after we knew we were called. We were there that, those years, and I was like, God, what in the world am I still here for? We know where I'm called to be, and I'm working in this mill where I know I'm not staying. This is wasted time. Listen, if you're following God and you're still living and being faithful with the last direction and revelation God gave you, you are being faithful where you are, you may not see it, you may not know it, but God is working in your life, in your heart, right where you are today to prepare and equip you for what's to come. You've got to walk by faith for the reality of it is, is this, you don't know all this to come. You know what you know, and there are other things you may think you know. But very often, even when God shows you something, where we get tripped up on it. We'd start in this church. I told you this on the 10th when we had the grand opening. One of the reasons we had a couple years of hesitation before we started this church is because I was looking for other people to do what God called me to do. So you can have a word from God that God's going to do something, but then you can get it in your mind how you're going to do it. No, God's plan takes you into God's land. You don't just have to have the vision. you got to listen every day to follow his steps to get there. Right? So he said, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So you are, if you've been obedient, you're perfectly prepared and position to fulfill and accomplish God's purpose in the earth. And I want to say this because I wrote it down and it's necessary and it says a warning. But there is no word for 2024 that any minister can give you that will automatically come to pass in your life. That's unbiblical. Any word from God that you fail to receive and apply will ultimately fail to produce change or results in your life. Obedience is required. People are following all kinds of people because they want to hear a word. Even this word will do nothing for you until you apply it and until you obey it, right? Many homes are falling all to pieces because they're doing it the world's way. You do it God's way. We don't have authority to change what marriage is. We don't have authority to change. You say, well, I, I can just do everything. No, you can't. You can't do everything. None of you can. There's things that men can do, women can't do. Get mad if you want to. There's things that women can do that men can't do. Get mad if you want to. At some point, we've got to stop being ignorant. God knew what he was doing, and he didn't just create woman. He created her with special gifts and talents and did the same thing with men. The men need the women and the women need the men. 
And when it operates, best when you do it God's way. But you always have so many people that come along and they got better ideas than the one that created you. It don't work. And they're proving these things daily. And I had to arrive, but I'm old enough now to realize in some of the things that I said years ago that was extremely unpopular then, now, 20 years later, people's grasping it. One of the things was, with, with, with further education in college, you need to listen to the Holy Ghost. If he leads you to a four-year school, that's where you go. But the four-year schools and universities, many of them are liberal universities. They're indoctrinating your children and people's raising their children in Christ, in the body of Christ, and sending them off and can't figure it out. What in the world happened to them? Well, you paid, or in a lot of cases, everybody else paid, for your children to go to school, and they got indoctrinated with Satan's strategies and plans to live. So they no longer are the way they was raised. Now, if God leads you that way, that's fine. You obey God. He knows best. I don't know everything. But now, even many Christians used to buy that doctrine, wish they hadn't, because that's part of the way we got in a mess. We are paying for our country to go in the toilet, so to speak. You're training people that way, training them how to be takers instead of contributors, training them. And the other one was the feminist movement is of the devil. Now the people that bought that many years ago are cold and lonely. I mean, there's just an article, and I don't read much news at all, but there's one of these ladies that was outraged. She was a devout feminist. And she said, now I'm 40-something years old and got nothing and nobody. They told me this was victory and freedom. Then my neighbor's over here barefoot and cooking, happy she can be with children running around. Then her husband chasing her. Because God don't know what he's doing. He's ignorant, right? We can want change all we want to in the church and in the house and everywhere, but you don't get change unless you're willing to change. It won't work. i got to look to the Word and say, is this what God said? Is this God's way? And if it's not, then we change. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. God's plan is the best plan. I didn't need to think about none of those things, but either way, you're grateful that you came. My doctrine won't help you, but the Word of God will, right? <coughs> Matthew 4. Verse 1, there's numerous ones we could use, numerous ones. See, we pray, we begin to pray and seek God. You know, I hear all this stuff. Like I said, I believe in revival. I believe in outpouring of the Spirit. I see the things the Lord's called us to do. I see thousands of people being ministered to. I see them healed and delivered and filled with the Holy Ghost, saved, all those things. It's all of God. I don't disagree with that. But you got to get there. You got 100 people, when we got everybody here, 100, whatever we got, you got 100 people and you believe in God for 300, if it takes change, you get to 300 and you're not willing to change, you never have it, no matter how much you confess it, no matter how much you say you believe it. You ever notice that if you're truly getting faith about something, God will immediately begin to deal with your heart about changing things. It's not to hurt you. It's not to destroy you. It's not. You may believe God for success in your business and say, I'm believing to go to this next level. He'll begin to deal with you about changing, maybe even certain things with people, because if you don't, you're not going to get there. That's not to hurt you. That's to help you. Same thing in the church. I've been corrected about numerous things. That's why we keep changing. Amen? Some of us have been hard -headed and the, more hard-headed than others, but the reality of it is, you know, you have people today in the church, they're proud they're hard-headed. Like, my God, the only thing worse than being hard-headed is proud of it stubbornness and pride and hard-headed is that of the spirit of the flesh that's the nature of the flesh i've dealt with people before and the lord told me i don't do it anymore it's been years but you just get sometimes you try to help people and you realize you want to help them more than they want help you ever dealt with people that way and sometimes you get frustrated because you spend hours praying and all this kind of stuff you really care for them really love them, you try to help them, you don't listen to nothing. I was sitting in my office one day praying about somebody, frustrated with them. I said, Lord, I don't know what else to do. He said, I don't know why you get offended. He said, what in the world make you think they're going to listen to you? He said, they don't listen to me either. He said, that's what the problem is. He said, that's why they got the life they got. 
He said, it's not you they don't listen to. He said, they don't listen to me either. They don't listen to nobody. Well, you can do anything you want to do, but that's the results you're going to get. That's why this message is for everybody. 2024 is a year of harvest. Several years ago, we entered into, and I didn't know all this at the time, but as I prayed it out, I learned it by the Holy Ghost. We entered into a time. You're praying for God to move, and you have this vision that, that God is going to do all these things in this place. He's going to take you to. Well, as soon as this, you begin to set your faith, God is going to see if you mean business. Because he don't tempt you with sin. That's the devil. But God will test you. That's a fact. God will lead you into a place so you can be refined. That's a fact. So things that hinder you from your prayer being answered can be removed. That's the truth. So we began to pray and seek God. And it was in 20, when y'all's aunt, it was 2017. When did y'all get married? 2019? Y'all got married in 18. So that was all the way back to 16 then. I got it mixed up. Y'all sure y'all got married in 2018? Yeah, because it's not 2024 yet. All right. I was thinking 2024. I'm doing the math. I'm thinking, uh, I know Morgan's got more college than me, but I can I can subtract four and five. I am that good. I got you. I'm thinking 24. It's 23. See, I'm already in the new year. I'm so far ahead of y'all. <laughs> I'm already in 24. Don't even come till tonight. But as soon as we begin to pray and seek God. So you got married when? 21? 18. So, so I, well, I had it mixed up. 2018. So this is all the way back in 2016 then. It was two years before they got married. The Lord began to, to deal with me. So we got several years. Like I said, I keep saying the same thing, two or three years. And you say two or three years for two or three years, it's got to be at least six or seven by now. You know, you add to it at some point or another. So it's been several years we were seeking God and, and got, we entered into a place. This is the three things that you'll see that take place when you set your faith with God and you need to go to the next level, there are some things that are necessary that happen in your life before you can enter into that place. And, and one thing will be, number one, would be the test. You'll be tested. You'll be tried. It's going to happen. The Lord will find out, are you going to obey me? Are you going to hold fast when others don't? Are you going to hold fast when, when the pressure gets punched up? What are you going to do in the fire? What are you going to do in the lion's den? What are you going to do when you run up to the Red Sea? What are you going to do when you're in the, in the, in the ship and all hope that you could be saved is taken away? What are you going to do? The test is coming. Four, Matthew, uh, verse one. There, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. This is a test. The first Adam, we know him, he failed the test and he forfeited God's best. Right? The second Adam passed the test and he moved into God's best, which was Jesus. The test is coming to every single one of us. The results you receive will be entirely up to you. It's what you do in the test that's going to determine the results. Matter of fact, the test comes to you, and then the decision that you make would be the sowing. The results would be the harvest because you reap what you sow. That's what Jesus did. Let's see what he did. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. When the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. He answered and said, it is written. How did he answer? He responded to the temptation from the enemy. Man shall not live by bread alone. He said, it is written. Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus saith unto him, It is written, Again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. The devil taketh him up unto an exceeding high mountain, showing all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Do you know if there's a price that you're willing to pay to forfeit God's plan and sell out to the devil? The devil will make you an offer. 
People don't realize that in the church. They say, oh, this will look so good. Well, Satan's the God of this world. He can offer you some things that look good that will take you away from God. Everything that looks good is not of God. He said unto him, all these things will I give thee if you'll fall down and worship me. There's a price tag that comes. Jesus said, get thee hence, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Now, many people want the angels to come and play in their hair and stuff. But listen, when you get in the fire and you're under the test, you got to stand on the word. you got to say, no, 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 no. God said, I don't care what you say, Mr. Devil. I don't care what your offer is. So we set our faith and we believe God, and the test came for multiple reasons. Number one, be to see if you meant what you said. Number two, any, in, any hindrance inside of you that would hinder you from moving in to that next level phase or promotion in your life must be dealt with. Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Many people major on being in the wilderness, major on the Word. They major on what the devil's doing, major on the Word. Some would say, God has not been in what I've been through and what's been done to me. I would say, well, I'm not going to disagree with you. What you've been through may have been a work of the devil. But if you've trusted God, he brought you through. The work may have been of the devil, but you'd have to admit God was with you. We know that the word tempt, even test, has a dual meaning. And concerning the devil, we know that his goal is to solicit you to sin. We understand that. But what's God's purpose? It's to test you. It's a putting to proof. Is it to hurt you and destroy you? No. God's purpose is to test you to be found true and move into his provision, move into promotion, move into that place he's called you to. The next level in your life. What's the most important thing that you can do to get into the next level in your life? Be faithful right where you are. Nothing's more important than that. The vision, the future, all the great things ahead that people like to talk about, they'll not come to pass without faithfulness in today. We know all the enemy wants to do is to do what? Trip us up. Solicit us to sin. Sin means miss the mark. He wants to get you out of the will of God. I had a vision. I've shared this with many of you guys. It was about what God was doing in some of your lives. Maybe he's already in the right flow. I don't know. But the Lord said there were some that was going through all kinds of different things that didn't understand why the track was so rough or the trek was so rough to get there. And I was praying in the Holy Ghost one day, and the Lord said to tell, I, I did. The Lord said, tell my people this because they don't understand what's going on. They know that I told them to make the decision, told them to make the move. I ministered a message entitled Make the Move. The Lord said that several years ago. And, and he said this, he, and I, this was the vision. I saw two streams. There was two flows, and, and, and there was all kinds of rocks and trees, just like in the mountains, in between the two streams. And, and you were in one, but the Lord led you to the other one. The other one was where you're supposed to be where you just go with the flow because the flow is the flow of God, the flow of the Spirit of God and all that he's got for you. This is where you need to be. Well, when you make that decision, as good as it is that you've heard from God, you have to cross over and there's rocks and trees and obstacles you had to cross over to get to where you need to be. It might have been hard and even seemed harder, but it's the will of God. And as you get in the right flow, then what do you do? You just go and flow and do and be. And you'll see all that God's promised you. It'll be just like he said it would be. Amen? Do you believe your best days are yet ahead of us? Genesis 19. And I barely even got started with this today, so I'm coming back. We got some things to talk about. Does it make any sense at all? God's been, the, the word, what he's been doing, we thank God for harvest now, but many of you has been going through. What you've been going through, we're not going to read that to close. Go to Acts 5 to close. We've been going through what we've been going through, many of you. 
not for the purpose of hurting you, but equipping you and preparing you for what's to come. I've had people to say, some say, some insinuate about different people's lives and different things, you know, about things that are happening that are bad, things that are happening that's been revealed in people's lives. Well, is it better that it's revealed and behind you or that it would be ahead and you didn't even know about it? God reveals things not to hurt you, but to help you. He'll reveal things in your life to you by the Spirit of God so you can address it, especially if it's a hindrance, not to hurt you. For my own self, and we won't look at that today. It's 1 Corinthians 11. We don't have time. I've been studying for my own personal studies and writing and such about God's justice system for a long time now. That's what I work on almost daily. Don't want to lie. I'm getting back in the flow of things. But I've been studying God's justice system. You know, God still judges his people. That's cursing today. But the first time God spoke that to me, Immediately when you hear that about somebody being judged, immediately what comes up? Not excitement. Not unless it's somebody you have a vengeance against. You know, Some people do. You shouldn't have that in your heart. But when you think about God's judgment, even in your own life, the Lord told me, he said, our minds are not renewed as a body about God's justice system and God even judging his own people. He said, my own people don't even know what it means. He said this to me. I wrote it down so I'd read it every time, and it's going to be included in my book. It's, I wrote it, I read it, the second one anyways. I, I write it down and read it every time. He said, my judgment, my justice system is an act of my love. To set things right that are wrong so my body and those in my body that are out of line can be corrected and get in line and flow in the blessings and life of God again. We're not going to go there, but over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you remember the fellow was sleeping with his, it was his stepmama, wasn't it? Paul said, I already turned him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. For what purpose? So that his soul will be saved in the day of judgment. See, God cared more about his eternity than he did his present. God cares more about your eternity than whether you're a little bit uncomfortable today. He cares more about your future in this earth than he cares about you being a little more uncomfortable today, one or the other. God loves us and he's forced. It pays to listen. It pays to obey. Don't be hard-headed in the spirit. This is a pattern. People say, I want revival. All right, I'm going to leave you with this thought then. This is You say, well, God was moving before this. I, did, I never said he wasn't. I didn't. It's like I'm preaching. It's harvest time. I didn't get anywhere I wanted to. But when we say it's harvest time, you remember when I first started preaching that, what the Holy Ghost said. I went home after I preached it the first time. I read that word the Lord gave me. And I went home the first time. He said, that's not good for everybody. He said, harvest time is only a time of celebration when you've sown the seeds of my word. He said, when you've sown seeds contradictory to my word, seeds of discord and discontent, he said, harvest time is sorrow time. We're coming into a time of seemingly extremes. You'll see people walk on the highest mountain and seemingly at the lowest valley they've ever been in their life. It's all going to be determined based on the decisions that we've made in our life. You say, are you preaching doom and gloom? Nope. The best day to start if you haven't started is today. God's a God of new beginnings and he's a God of mercy. I never said he wasn't, but I'm just talking to you by the Holy Ghost where we are. Verse 1. Of Acts chapter 5, a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira's wife sold a possession, kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. We know the story. Ananias and Sapphira, they had saw, if you went back into chapter 4, they'd seen Barnabas and others that were given, right? They lied. They were called out by the Holy Ghost. It wasn't by Peter, it was by the Holy Ghost. It was addressed. And what happened to them? They were, I told you, being a, be careful. You said, I got so and so that agrees with me. Ananias had somebody to agree with him. Sapphira agreed with him. Both of them died. Just because you agree with somebody or somebody agrees with you, don't get too excited. Right? But, but they wanted, they, they were not given from a right heart motive. They wanted to credit. 
that Barnabas and the others had got of being givers. They're lying. They lied to God. They were deceitful. They were hypocrites. And then what happened? They both died, and they both got buried. They're dead. They're gone. This is in the early church where there's been miracles and stuff happening, and you would think in the natural everybody would get scared and in fear. Oh, my God, what are we going to do now? Who's next? But when this was addressed in the church, I want to leave you with what happened. See, people say, I want revival. You're willing to pay the price. Have you counted the cost and said, I don't care what it is, I'll pay it? Took me years to get to that place. You may already be there. That's great. But the results of this is in verse 12. It's going to be the name and the text for something that we do in the years to come. I don't know when, but I got it marked in my Bible. And by the hands of the apostle, apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And the rest, there's no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them, and the believers were added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on the beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. You say, I believe in lay hands on the spirit, lay hands on the sick, and they be healed, casting out the devils, and they be set free. I believe in preaching the gospel, all of these things. Listen, it's got to be about God. When whatever he requires, we have to be willing to, to, to go with. We got to be willing. So I, don't, I just don't know about God knows best. What he says changes what you change. In the church, at your house, in your life, don't be looking at everybody else. What do you need to change? You say, well, what about you? I do it every day. And I don't intend on stopping. I don't think I have arrived, but I'm on the right path. I'm following the right plan, and I thank God for that. Amen? I thank God I'm lined up where he can speak to me. So we had the test, and we've been tested, and we've been tried. See, a lot of people think that way back yonder, a lot of people think the coronavirus has been gone. It's not. Watch and see what happens. So you saying the virus comes back? No, but the harvest is here. So why are you still talking about that? Because that was sowing time. That was in the fire time. Now it's moved with the Holy Ghost time. You say, oh, well, it don't matter. Everybody shut down, did the No, they didn't. Everybody didn't. The majority did. Everybody didn't. You say, that don't matter. That's not what God told me. And I've been telling you this for several years now. It's not what he said. He didn't say it during then. It's not what he's saying now. That was a test, and many failed the test. When you fail the test, you forfeit God's best. See, we got this thing. We live in this country, and it's messed up. Now, I thank God for America, and I pray for our leaders. It's messed up. This effort to make everybody equal is stupidity. Everybody's not equal. You might have equal opportunity, but everybody's not equal. It's not. And people get confused if you want to take from the lazy, take from the rich and the one that worked hard and give it to the lazy tail. God don't operate that way. We get over here in stewardship, you will be highly upset with God. You will be highly upset with him. God actually takes from the one that has less and did nothing with it. He takes that one and gives it to the rich that's rich because they're a good steward. That's how God operates. You go read Matthew 25 for yourself when you get home. He don't operate that way. And if we're going to walk in God's best, we've got to operate like God operates. Amen? He entrusts those things that are serious and important to him. He entrusts it to the faithful. The test came. We've been faithful to the test. And I'm going to tell you, our best days are yet ahead of us. 47 years old. And, of course, I don't remember when I first started hearing, learning, seeing, and knowing, and all that kind of stuff. As a baby or spiritual, I don't remember the exact year. I know that I'm growing, and I thank God for that, but I do know this. I've never been warned and been cautioned about the blessing that's to come, and I thank God that I've been warned. We're coming into our best time yet, the best season we've ever been in. But I want to encourage you in your life. Don't think that just because you get a word from me or here at this church or you got five people, or maybe some people's got 50 people, is telling you all this stuff's going to happen. Don't be deceived and think it's going to happen in your life. That's not how it works. You don't reap what a man preached. 
say, are you negating prophecy? Living by it the way a lot of people do, I am negating it because it's not of God. If it contradicts the word, it don't matter who said it. You reap what you sow and you reap what you say, not what somebody else said. Now, if somebody is of God and they pray and seek God and something comes fresh off the press from heaven, it's a word from the Lord, you receive it and apply it, yeah, it'll produce fruit in your life. But it is not going to happen just because you got a word from somebody. It's not. That's why you have people in the same church. One walks with God and walks in the blessing, and one goes the exact opposite way. It's not because God doesn't love. It's not because God's not provided opportunity. We all have equal opportunity to succeed in this life. It's what you do with what you've been given. You and I have a responsibility. Are we going to be serious? Are we going to trust God? Stand to your feet. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. We love you and thank you for this day. Your many blessings, your hand upon us. Your spirit leading and guiding and directing us. Thank you for who you are and all that you've done. Thank you for what you brought us through. Thank you for the place you brought us to. And thank you as we trust you together, our best days are yet ahead of us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We just praise you and glorify you. Anything you want to say and do. Nothing's gone as according to plan for me. So I want to make sure that I've heard from you and that I'm not cutting you short. You're so good, your mercy endures forever. We just lay down life and surrender to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The greatest thing we could do for ourselves, our families, our friends, and the kingdom of God, the greatest thing we could do is give our life to you. Nothing can be greater. And to be that vessel that you've called us to be so you can flow in and through us. We're conducive of all that you have and all that you are. You can flow in and through us and be a blessing to this lost and dying world and our brothers and sisters in Christ. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I don't know this Jesus, the Lord and Savior of my life, that's where it starts, is with Jesus. He said, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved forever. Calls upon his name will be saved. If you're hearing you say, yes, Pastor, I want you to pray with me to make Jesus Lord of my life. You can just come down here and I'll be glad to pray with you. Anybody in the place, number two, you say, I know I'm a Christian, I have no doubt. But I got out of fellowship, want to rededicate my life today. God will forgive you. He said, if you confess that you sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you. Cleanse you of your sins and all unrighteousness. You need to pray with you to rededicate your life to God. You can come down now and I'll be glad to pray with you. Number three, the altar is still open, I'm not rushing. I'll pray with you on any one of them. You say, I know I'm a Christian, I have no doubt, but I've never been filled with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking other tongues. I can't make you do anything or not try, but we're going to be giving you the word. Jesus told the disciples, told the apostles, tarry you here in the city of Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. The great commission was given, but they were told to wait till they was filled with the Holy Ghost and power. In order to accomplish what God's called you to any day and time, but especially in this hour that we're living, you're going to have to know how to depend on the Holy Ghost and the power of the Holy Ghost. You're going to have to be in communication with heaven on a regular basis. You need to be filled with the Holy Ghost and power. You need to really spend time praying in other tongues. We're going to start doing things the Lord told me to. I'm very private, so he has to deal with me about this. People sometimes think that I'm ashamed of this, that, or the other. I'm not ashamed of anything. But I am a private person. So I would naturally yield certain ways if I'm not careful. But the Lord said, I want you to not only say it, but I want you to lead by example. We're going to do that Wednesday night to start with. Again, if you want me to pray with you to be filled with the Holy Ghost and power, you can come down now and the anointing's here to do so. But that's going to be one of the things that we move into in a greater measure teach on so your faith is there so you can receive but we're going to move into it this year we're word people but the vision's only accomplished through the word of God and by the anointing of the spirit of God right you got any special needs you can come down I'll be glad to pray for you four things y'all want to take more note just joking brother Hagin said he's talking to dry and dead churches he was affiliated with Come on, Miss Marie. He's talking to the churches that he would be, he was affiliated with. I'll be right here. And he said, they asked him, 
what would you do? We're dry and we're dead and all this kind of stuff. Need to sell our buildings because the people aren't coming. And he said the Holy Ghost told him four things that the body of Christ needed to thrive. Born again spirits, number one. Number two, spirits filled with the Holy Ghost and power. Number three, minds renewed with the Word of God. Number four, spend time daily praying in the Holy Ghost. Hear what God's saying. So we're going to move into those things. we thank you Father you said to lay hands on the sick we thank you Father we know what the doctor said even to Miss Marie but she stands at this altar because she knows the great physician we speak right now in the name of Jesus we thank you for the healing power of God being administered to this body specifically those eyes we do not accept that disorder disease we say right now she's healed and whole in Jesus name she can see and her eyes are functioning just like you created them to crystal clear in Jesus' name, healed and whole is done and so right now in Jesus' name. Now you just continue to thank God that it's done and we're in agreement with you that it's so in Jesus' name. God is with us and God is good. Well, we love you. We appreciate you. Thank God for all he's done and doing. We'll be back Wednesday night. Again, do what you can, but it'd be beneficial if you could be here because all these services, we just got started this morning, they're going to flow together. So it's good for you to be in the flow. God's going to speak to us. But he'll speak to you Monday and Tuesday too. God is with us. We love you. Be blessed. You're dismissed.